Our scripture reading for today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 58. And it says, I tell you this, brothers and sisters, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body, perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, hi, church. Every time uh, I look in this camera and say hello to you, I'm reminded of how much I miss you and how much I long to be with you. I hope that you're having a good day. And before we uh, conclude our sermon series here through 1 Corinthians 15 and the hope of resurrection and look at what are some of the more beautiful paragraphs in all of Scripture, I want to just uh, make you a couple of announcements this morning and a couple of things for you to be aware of uh, this week. Um, Today is Tuesday, and, uh, and I want to remind you that this Thursday at 7 p.m., um, <clears throat> uh, we will host our annual Churchwide Ascension Day celebration. And so uh, that'll be at 7 p.m. on Zoom, and uh, it's one of my favorite services uh, that we have in terms of just worshiping the Lord together as we remember that the Lord Jesus ascended. And so, um, so that is uh, this Thursday night. Um, you may be watching this, and it's Friday. Sorry. It was last night, and it was awesome. But uh, the other thing is that um, our teaching, our central weekly teaching that we've been having throughout uh, these days where we're scattered, uh, we are moving that from Wednesday nights at 8.30 p.m. Uh, to Tuesday mornings at 10 a.m. Uh, many of you have communicated that in preparing to gather with your um, small groups on Sunday for your Sunday gatherings, that it would be beneficial for you to have the teaching earlier in the week as you listen to it in uh, in preparation and so we're trying to get it earlier each week and so again we'll be doing that at 10 a.m on tuesday mornings if you care to watch the live stream i know most of you have not been doing that but if you do it's going to be at 10 a.m on most tuesday mornings but it will not be next tuesday morning uh, because there will be no central weekly teaching next week because the following sunday may the 31st is pentecost sunday which as one of the early fathers of the church called it it's uh, a great Sunday in the life of the church. He actually called it the great Sunday, where we remember that Jesus, after he ascended, he sent the Holy Spirit to lead and empower us to pick up our cross and follow him uh, as his people. And so Pentecost is a day of feasting and celebrating for the church. And so like we did on Easter Sunday, we're going to meet on Zoom for a churchwide uh, Pentecost celebration service, and uh, it won't look the exact same as the celebration service on Easter did, <clears throat> but the tone of the evening will be the same. There will be more testimony, more singing, less teaching than there was on Easter, but certainly a tone of celebration as we culminate and celebrate the culmination of this Easter season that we've been walking through together these uh, past seven weeks and celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so those are a few things that are going on, but today we're going to try to finish our teaching through 1 Corinthians 15 as we have been focusing on the hope of resurrection that uh, we have, that we look forward to even as God's people. And, uh, and today as we, as we finish our meditations on this part of Paul's instruction to the Corinthians, Paul brings his instruction in this part of his letter that we call 1 Corinthians, he brings his instruction about the resurrection of the dead to an unforgettable place, a place in Scripture that is perhaps unrivaled in its vision that it proclaims to us about the transformation that will take place in us as God's people, in our physical bodies when the Lord Jesus returns and you know certainly our culture loves transformation stories 
Uh, we're, we're drawn to them. We're inspired by them. And in many ways, we're dependent upon them for our hope. So whether it's rags to riches stories or fool being transformed into, transformed into the wise or it's an underdog who somehow emerges victorious in our books and our movies and our documentaries and our television shows and our podcasts, we cannot get enough of stories that involve transformation and oftentimes unimaginable transformation. And, and what Paul tells us here as he brings his instruction in 1 Corinthians 15 to a close, it explains why as humans we're so drawn and inspired and desperate for transformation stories because all of these stories of transformation, both in fiction and in reality, they're shadows that point us to the true story of the world. A true story that has at its heart, at least for those of us who have bowed our hearts and lives in faithful allegiance to God, a story that has at its heart transformation. A more glorious transformation that though it lay at the heart of Christianity, a more glorious transformation that is yet beyond our ability to imagine, even as Christians. And this, of course, as we've been saying, is precisely what's been going on with some of these Christians in this ancient city called Corinth that Paul has been instructing. Some of the Christians in this little house church, they're having a difficult time imagining how bodily resurrection can be true, how the dead can be raised in the body. They understand and they trust that the Lord Jesus has been raised from the dead, but, but given their low view of the human body and their very, very high view and holy view of God, these Christians can't imagine how Christians will have their bodies raised from the dead like Christ. They can't imagine how such mortal, perishable bodies as these that we have now could possibly inhabit the heavens, the very abode of God, how, they, how these kind of bodies could inherit the kingdom of God. And so these Christians have reverted to denying that there will be or that maybe even that there can be a resurrection of the dead. And Paul has been instructing them about why they are mistaken all throughout 1 Corinthians 15. And yet here in verse 50, if you're looking there in your Bible, as Paul begins to bring his instruction to this church to a close about the resurrection of the dead, he tells them, as misguided and wrong as they've been about a number of things that he's corrected, he tells them they are right about one thing in verse 50. Look what he says. He says, I tell you this, brothers and sisters, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. And so, so Paul says to these Christians who are denying even the resurrection of the dead, he says, you're right about one thing. And what you're right about is that these natural bodies, this flesh and blood that we have now, that bears, as we talked about last week, the image of the man of dust, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Because what is perishable cannot inherit what is imperishable. And so, so Paul tells these Christians in Corinth, listen, you've, you've got that much right. It makes sense that you'd be struggling trying to imagine how this perishable body could inherit something that is imperishable, like the kingdom and presence of God. He says, but what you've got wrong, what you've not imagined yet, is that there is a day coming when this flesh and blood, when our physical bodies, which are perishable now, will be transformed into flesh and blood, into spiritual bodies that are imperishable. What you've not imagined is that even as we bear the image of the man of dust in our bodies now, one day we will bear the image of the man of heaven, our resurrected Lord. And then Paul, in some of the most stunning sentences in all of Holy Scripture, he describes what this transformation will be like. Starting in verse 51, he says, Behold, look! I tell you a mystery, Paul says. A mystery is something that used to be concealed or hidden, but that God has now revealed. He says, I tell you a mystery. And what is that mystery that God has revealed, Paul says? We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised 
imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body that cannot inherit the kingdom of God now must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. Church, this is what those in Corinth had been missing in their theology. They were missing this mystery that Paul proclaims, this mystery that whether dead or alive, not everybody's going to be dead when the Lord Jesus returns, but whether dead or alive, when the trumpet sounds and heaven is unveiled, and even if you take the you know, imagery of the trumpet as it's announcing uh, a king coming, the, 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 the trumpet sounds, heaven is unveiled, the curtains are pulled back, and our royal Lord, our king, when he reappears, when that happens, at that moment, Paul says, we will all be changed in a great act of new creation that we can't even imagine. In a moment, he says, in, in, in the twinkling of an eye, literally the Greek there is, is, is an atom, like the smallest amount of time imaginable, the bodies of all those who are in Christ, all those that have fallen asleep and those who are still alive, will be completely changed. In a flash, Paul says, our perishable bodies, again, this flesh and blood that as it is cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But in a flash, he says, our perishable bodies will put on the imperishable, our mortal bodies, when the Lord Jesus returns, will put on immortality. And I like the, the language, the imagery that Paul even uses here of putting on. It's, it's the language, of course, that he uses, that we use over and over again each day of putting on clothing. And, you know, for me, the imagery takes me back to the days of my youth. Uh, when, when I was growing up, I loved Superman. And uh, I think that Josh has got a picture here to show you. I loved Superman. My mama made that for me. I wore it every day. That was it. I was Superman. And, uh, and every day for me, that was me running around, saving the day. And I would pretend that I was Superman, who, for those of you who are utterly unfamiliar with Superman, <clears throat> I feel weird even having to explain this. Superman was really a, a man named Clark Kent just an average looking guy, Clark was, who would, when it was time, because he had this sort of hidden power, this superpower, when it was time, this ordinary looking guy would go into the phone booth and in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, he would take off his mortal man clothes, his suit and tie, and it would reveal his Superman suit that looked, as you saw, much better on me. Um, and then he'd have this suit and he'd fly off out of the phone booth or wherever he was to, to save the day. And so he would enter the phone booth as just a normal man and then he would exit it having put on fitting clothing for a super man. And, you know, that's what came to my mind this week as I was trying to imagine what Paul said here. Obviously, Paul's not talking about literal clothing He's talking about our physical bodies. He's talking about our flesh and blood. And the mystery he proclaims and is proclaiming is that somehow in God's power, he's going to put on, God is going to clothe our imperishable bodies with, Im, with our perishable bodies rather, with imperishability. God is going to put on, he's going to cause our mortal bodies to be clothed in immortality. And for those who are still alive when it happens, one moment they're going to be bearing the image of the man of dust. And then in an instant, they're going to put on, they're going to bear the image of the man of heaven. They're going to have a body like that of the Lord Jesus. A resurrected body. Behold, indeed, church, this wondrous mystery that Paul proclaims. Again, a mystery that was missing in the theologies of these in Corinth. And Paul then goes on to say in verse 54, he says, when that happens, when the perishable body puts on the imperishable, the mortal body puts on and is clothed in immortality like the Lord Jesus, then he says shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up it's gulped down in victory. 
O death, where is your victory on that day? O death, where is your sting? In church, rightfully so, these are some of the most famous verses in all of Scripture. And this is where all of Paul's instruction to these in Corinth, starting all the way back in chapter 15, verse 1, where all of it's been leading, this is the heart of the hope that he is proclaiming to this church and that he is instructing instructing those who were denying it in. This is the heart of the hope that he's proclaiming to us, this transformation. And the gospel that Paul declares here is he quotes from, and he echoes the imagery of two biblical passages. If you want to go read them later, he's echoing Isaiah 25 and Hosea 13. He's sort of imagining him in his own words, and he's bringing them together here. And, and, and what he's declaring is that on this glorious day, when the trumpet sounds and heaven opens and the Lord Jesus returns and our bodies and the twinkling of an eye are transformed, on this day, the ancient story which the Bible tells, as one put it, will finally and fully come true. The story of creation will finally reach its intended goal. When the Creator God's victory foreshadowed all along, right, in Scripture, all along in, in God's defeat and overthrow of the enemies of his people, enemies like Egypt and Assyria and Babylon, that day will finally come to pass that all of those other days of the Lord have been pointing to. When the ultimate enemies of God's people, the forces of sin and death carried along by Satan, when those enemies on the day of the Lord will be overthrown. And so just like the Egyptians were swallowed into the heart of the sea as it closed back over them in the Exodus, on that day when the Lord returns, when the trumpet sounds, metaphorically speaking, and we're changed, death will be swallowed up into the victory of God. And the victory cry of God's people will ring out among the nations. O death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? And church, just a couple of things here I want you to notice. Um, firstly, there's coming a day when God's defeat of death will be publicly revealed and celebrated on earth as it is in heaven. And we as God's people must never, especially in light of all that we've been meditating on in this season as a church, about the body and about death more particularly, we should, as God's people, never forget what kind of victory this is. This is a victory that is even too glorious for words. The sting of death that Paul mentions here, it reminds us of just how glorious this victory is by reminding us of just how powerful and painful death is. The only reason one would need to proclaim in the midst of victory, O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Is because it seems in the here and now like death has won the victory. The only reason we would say, O oh, death, where is your sting? Because death in the here and now, it stings. It's venomous. It's horrible. And even more, you know, as we've, we've talked about this before, you know, theologically speaking, death is not just a vague sort of gentle passing into the immortality of afterlife. In Jewish theology, death was seen as a monarch. Death was seen as a realm, as a kingdom unto itself. And of course, the New Testament picks up on this Jewish personification of death and even adds to it, and particularly the Apostle Paul, as he's even doing here. As he does here, Paul personifies, he speaks of death in human terms. He personifies it. He speaks of it as a power, a, a sort of hostile power, a monarch of sorts that, uh, you know, is in partnership with and in submission to its Lord, Satan. And as Paul and others picture death as a power, it's a power that imprisons human souls without any sort of hope of escape. And so, Outside of the Lord Jesus, death is an experience, it's an experience of condemnation and defeat at the hands of God's enemy. And certainly this, this understanding of death, it points us toward the mysterious realm in the Old Testament that's often called Sheol or Hades. 
this cruel empire also in the New Testament, this cruel empire of Satan that's called hell. Again, death is seen as a realm, a kingdom, a power that is utterly separate and separated from and forsaken by God. It is a place overseen by a Lord that is not God. It's a place where God is not. It's a realm that destroys earthly life and always looms, as one put it, as an unremitting threat to human beings in the here and now. And so all that to say, you get a more robust understanding of death. When Paul quotes Isaiah 25, when he quotes Hosea 13 here, and he proclaims to this church in Corinth and to us that on that day, when after having put every enemy under his feet, the trumpet will reverberate through the earth and the Lord Jesus will return and death will be gulped down and swallowed up in victory, that is a glorious announcement. That is a glorious gospel. The day when God's defeat of death will be publicly revealed and celebrated on earth as it is in heaven. And it will be plain for all to see because dead bodies of God's people will come out the ground. And death will be humbled in the sight of all. And God will overpower the kingdom of death and turn this ever-present threat of plague and penalty that comes with it into a victory cry for his people. This is the ultimate transformation, the ultimate reversal that Paul is talking about here, church. And so, hear ye, hear ye this announcement of good news about what Paul's saying in death being swallowed up in victory. Let it be as marvelous to you as it truly is. The second thing, though, church, to remember, and that I want to sort of highlight here, is that we get to share as co-heirs in God's victory over death. This is His victory that we get to share in. And, you know, um, sports enthusiasts uh, often, I think rightfully so, get mocked based on their use of pronouns. You know, the language of we that fans often use, we, we won, I can't believe we won, and people are often saying, uh, who's the we here, friend, you're, you ain't on the team, you're not out there, you ain't got no uniform on, you didn't hit that ball, you didn't kick that goal, you didn't make that shot, you didn't do anything in the offseason actually, you don't even know how to ice skate, you're on your couch in Denton, Texas, watching on a screen, so what do you mean we? That, that's probably the wrong pronoun. People get mocked often. Uh, fans do. And, I, and I'll leave uh, the philosophical debates about using such pronouns when talking about sports to others, to you, those of you that right now are even provoked in your spirit. But, you know, what I did wonder this week as I was meditating on this passage is if there's not something in all of us deep down that longs to say we about certain things, particularly certain victories, because of what Paul says right here. The good news at the heart of the universe is that there is a God who one day will swallow up death in victory and be all in all. And on that day when God's victory and kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven, all who are in Christ, who have been united in their faith and allegiance, by their faith and allegiance to the Lord, will share in God's victory. Though we weren't there at creation, though we didn't die on a cross, though we were not the first fruit of resurrection, we will be part of the great harvest. We will be part of the great victory of God. A victory, again, that's going to be made plain to all when God raises us victorious from the dead, just like He did our Christ. In church, Though we didn't do anything to earn this victory. On the day our risen Lord returns, we, his brothers and sisters, we will share in it. We will join him as co-heirs with the rest of the saints in receiving this inheritance. And we will say, if not seeing, that the power called death that has taunted and haunted us our entire lives, we will say, if not seeing, O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? And not because of anything we've done. Not because of anything we've earned. 
but because through our Lord Jesus, our God will give us, He will give us as a gift of grace the final victory over death that the Lord Jesus has achieved for us. Which is exactly what Paul says in verse 56. He says, the sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's amazing. And what Paul's doing here, he's explaining this victory over death that we are given to share in by our God by explaining the sting of death that he mentioned up in verse 55. He basically here explains how death works. Paul says the sting of death is sin. And so in other words, as Paul would explain in some of his other letters in more detail, and particularly maybe in his letter to the churches in and around Rome that we call Romans, the sting in death is that it separates people from God. And, and from the beginning, that is what sin, that is what treason and rebellion against our high king, God, and his kingdom does, brings about. That's the wages of treason and rebellion and sin is, is death. Sin has always separated and alienated people from God. And that separation and alienation from God is permanent for those who are not in Christ. And so this is where Paul says, Death gets its sting. It's where it gets its venom from. From this other dark power and enemy called sin that under the oversight of Satan is constantly enticing people to turn away from the one true God and King who alone gives life. And then Paul, he adds to his explanation of death and he says, and the power of sin is the law. So in other words, sin, which is the sting of death, it it gets its power, or at least some power, from the law. And, and though Paul doesn't go into detail here to explain what he means, like he does in Romans chapter 7, Paul's point here is that the law, that the Torah, or the instruction that God gave his people through Moses in order for his people to avoid sin, in order for his people to avoid destruction and actually find life in God and the land that he was leading them to, what Paul is saying here is that Oftentimes, the Torah, the law, the instruction God gave does the opposite. Somehow, sin draws the law, the, the good instruction of God, into its orbit. And as one put it, sin makes the law, it makes the commands and the instructions of God an ally of death rather than of life. Which is what the law was given for, to lead to life. And yet sin, in the way that it does brings the law as an ally that leads rather to death for many people. And this, Paul says, is, is how the monarch, this great enemy of death, goes about stinging and stealing and destroying humanity. Which, again, makes what Paul says in verse 57 all the more glorious. He says, thanks, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So he's saying, though, though it may not seem like it in the here and now, while death still stings and still puts us to sleep, those who are united to the Lord Jesus already have and will one day eternally experience complete victory over death, not least in our bodies. God has given and will give us as his people in the future victory over all of the enemies all of the powers that haunt and taunt and scare and overpower us now. That is what the Lord Jesus is doing right now. He is reigning and putting all of the enemies of God and of, therefore of us as his people as a footstool underneath his feet. And this victory that God will bring, that he has already brought about, Paul says, is through our Lord Jesus Christ. By which Paul means through the Lord Jesus' life and death and resurrection. Our forgiveness of sins, our redemption from the law, and our resurrection from the dead all comes to us through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And again, it's the last issue there, the resurrection of the dead, that these Corinthians have failed to grasp. They seem to understand that the Lord Jesus' death and resurrection has achieved for them the forgiveness of sins, which is the sting of death. They seem to understand that the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus has achieved for them redemption from the law, which is the power of sin. But they're denying the ultimate victory, their own resurrection of the dead, that Jesus' death and resurrection has achieved for them. And so this is precisely the good news that Paul's proclaiming to them and instructing them throughout this entire part of this letter to embrace the hope of resurrection, the final victory over death that has been purchased for them and that one day will be experienced by them in no uncertain terms. Paul is saying to these Christians in Corinth and to us that through the life and death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, we Christians have been and will one day be delivered from the sting of this fallen world that is under the dominion and the tyranny of sin and death. Paul is wanting them to know that though it doesn't seem like it, doesn't feel like it right now, this victory, particularly over death, has already been won by our Christ. And in a moment... In the twinkling of an eye, we will all, one day when Christ returns, whether dead or alive, we will be transformed and made like him. This is the hope that these Corinthians are not embracing, that Paul says, you have. God has given it to you. Don't deny the resurrection of the dead, which ultimately is the final expression of, of the very hope we have through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so what? As we end here. How does this future hope and assurance Paul's proclaiming to them that theologically he's sort of been going around and arguing in different ways about the resurrection of the dead, how does that help us now? And how is it different than the hope of heaven? Non-bodily sort of spiritual heaven. But today, in a world that seems to be dominated by headlines of sin and death, how, how and why does this matter? I mean, it's encouraging to know that we're going to one day be raised from the dead. To say the least, that's encouraging, right? It's encouraging to know that one day we're going to have our bodies completely transformed and clothed for the new creation that God will bring about. But how does that future hope that we as Christians who are a forward-looking people How does that future hope that we're meant to orient and live toward and remind ourselves of, not least every single Sunday when we gather, how does that help and empower us and comfort us as God's people now? I'm so glad you asked. Because I think that's actually one of the most surprising things about Paul's instruction here in 1 Corinthians 15 when it comes to the resurrection of the dead. It's the way that he ends his instruction. You might think that Paul went in all of his instruction by saying to the church, in conclusion, let's rejoice at this wonderful hope that we have to look forward to one day. But he does not do that. Instead, look what he does in verse 58. Look what he says. He says, therefore, here's why it matters today. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. That is amazing and quite surprising that this is how he ends this whole portion of his letter. Churches, if it's true that our God is going to completely transform our bodies and this entire creation along with them one day, then that means, Paul is saying, that what we do in the presence of in the present, rather, in our bodies, in our world, matters. That's why it matters. The only way we know that any of this matters is because there's going to be a new creation, because we're going to be raised physically. So we know that physicality matters. Creation matters to God. And, you know, N.T. Wright, uh, he's a theologian. He's probably thought about this as much as anybody. He says this. He says, quote, For far too long, many Christians have been content to separate our future hope from present responsibility. But that is precisely what Paul refuses to do. 
His full body doctrine and promise of resurrection sends us as Christians back to our present world and our present life of bodily obedience to our Lord in the glorious but sobering knowledge that if there is continuity between who and what we are in the present and who and what we will be in the future, then we cannot discount this present life, this present body, or this present world as irrelevant. End quote. So in other words, church, there is no such thing in the kingdom of God as being too heavenly minded to be of any earthly good. There's no such thing. If we, if we even understand what that means, because to be heavenly minded in the way that Paul talks about it here means that our hope is set as Christians, not on some sort of spiritual thing in the long run, but rather on new creation, on a new creation that includes our own as resurrection. That's what it means to be heavenly minded, is to be focused on the hope of the resurrection, which means then that whatever we do, as Paul puts it here in verse 58, whatever we do in the Lord will last, will matter, will stand for all time. Because of the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of the dead to come, not only are we, church of all people, not most to be pitied in this world, we are rather, of all people, the ones who wake up each day knowing that in the Lord, nothing we ever do is in vain. In the Lord, nothing we ever do is in vain. The work in the Lord that we do is never in vain. And I don't know about you, family, but this is one of the greatest encouragements to me. And indeed, as Paul instructs this church here, um, man, the way that our future hope shapes my hope today it encourages me today. It strengthens me. It inspires me today to remain steadfast and immovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord today because of this. Because this is true. Because the resurrection of the dead, based on the resurrection of Christ, is true. And so even as, as Wright and others go on to say, you know, how God's going to take our prayers, our art, our love, our writing, our political action, our music, our honesty, our evangelism, our daily work, our pastoral care, our teaching, our whole selves, how God's going to take it all and weave its varied strands into the glorious tapestry of new creation, we can at present have no idea. I don't even think we can imagine, but that he will do it. As Christians, we must be assured. And church, this is why Ascension Day matters. This is why Pentecost matters so much. This is why we celebrate and we feast on these days because Jesus ascended and he was enthroned as Lord and he sent us his spirit so that we could, as his people, in this great hope of resurrection that we've been given and in the power of his great spirit that we've been given, that we could be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord until the Lord returns to make all things new. In church, this is why we're so drawn and inspired and desperate for transformation stories because all the stories of transformation that we like to listen to and watch and hear about both in fiction and reality, they are shadows that point to this true story of transformation. A story that has at its heart, at least for us, who have bowed and continue to bow day by day our hearts and lives in faithful allegiance to our creator God at the heart of the hope we have is transformation. Beloved, there is a resurrection. There is a transformation that is coming. And though we can't imagine it now, it is coming as surely as the dawn. So be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Father, we pray you would teach us and help us to do that. We thank you for your Son, our Lord, who again, this victory that you will give to us and allow us to inherit, it comes through him. Jesus, we honor you. We love you. We thank you that you came and became like us, 
a human. You put on flesh and blood. And unlike us, you lived every day of your life perfectly righteous. And then you died for us in our place. And we so rejoice that your Father raised you from the dead and that even as you ascended, you sent us your good spirit so that we could follow you and we could live our lives into this great hope that you have achieved and purchased for us. Teach us to do that. Teach us even these words, immovable, steadfast, always abounding in the hope of the Lord, the work of the Lord. Make us a church that that would be something that marks us in our witness together in this city and perhaps especially in these days. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and we ask. Amen.